Right. Thank you. Uh, so I would like to talk about secure messaging. And in particular, I'd like to talk about end-to-end -end encrypted secure messaging uh, with all the whiz-bang flash secure ratcheting stuff that we've seen a couple years ago from Signal's two-party ratchet. Uh, so the idea here is to have strong security guarantees in what we think really is a practical context. Okay. Why do you want group messaging? And the answer is that if you actually think about the messaging you do day to day on your phones, group messaging is not a sort of special feature compared to one to one. On your phones in WhatsApp or Allo or Slack or whatever, group messaging is just as native a feature as one to one messaging. And so we want everything you have for one to one, we would like to have for group as well. One interesting piece of context in this setting, in the messaging world, unlike, say, TLS or SSH, you can't assume that anybody you're talking to is online. And this is because people will be connected to hotel Wi-Fi, will be on an airplane, their phone radio might switch off to save power. And so at any time, we can never make an assumption that the person you're talking to is going to come online and reply to you. For all you here, I don't really need to motivate why we want end-to-end -end encryption, right? Uh, we live in a world of untrusted service providers. We'd like to reduce the trust we put in the cloud and the ISPs on hardware and so on. And one way to reduce this trust is end-to-end -end encryption. The other thing that, um, and this surprised me when we first started working on it, is that scalability is actually a really important concern here. So you might think, well, group is important, but you know, groups are size two or size three, maybe half a dozen. And so you might be able to just make this work by running a pairwise protocol, then paying a linear cost. So you encrypt every message six times to six different people. And for six people, this actually more or less works. Six times overhead is kind of painful, but you can just about stomach it. But there's a couple of reasons why you actually want to scale much better than this. So one of them is that we no longer have one device per person, right? I have two phones and a laptop right here on stage. I have another personal laptop at home. I might have be logged in on a couple more computers elsewhere. And that means if I'm a member of a group and I want to do multiple device membership using my whiz-bang flashy group messaging protocol, then I need to multiply all my group sizes by five or 10. So that already puts us, if I'm messaging a research group, that puts us into 20s and 30s. And that starts to get expensive. But it's even worse than that because there's a whole bunch of use cases we would one day maybe like to have end-to-end -end encryption for. You can imagine messaging everybody in this room or everybody at CCS. I mean, a Slack channel that has 900 people. And it would be cool if one day we could build an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging protocol that worked for them too. And so there we really need, there's a couple of things you can't have. You can't have linear scaling in that context. You need one shared group key that works for everybody. Right, so you need to derive somehow a group key, send one copy of a message to a server, and have that server fan out. And indeed, this is what many implementations do today. Uh, they use what's called the sender key variant of Signal protocol. And the sender key variant is we run Signal pairwise, and we'll send a symmetric key over those pairwise channels to everybody else. <laughs> you'll send a symmetric key pairwise to everybody else. And this symmetric key then doesn't change, it gets hash ratcheted forward, but no fresh entropy is put in unless you do an expensive operation. And this means that sender keys does not have post-compromised security. What's post-compromised security? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, so uh, in the normal, maybe very old protocol security setting, uh, you send a message and that message is secret. We realized a while ago this wasn't really enough. You want forward secrecy as well. And forward secrecy says, if something bad happens, you lose your keys, a corruption occurs, then the messages you sent before, those messages are still secret. And this is good. This is a strong property. We'd like it in our protocols. But it doesn't say anything about what happens after the bad event happens, right? Because if you get malware on your phone, you're not going to stop using WhatsApp. You might like wipe the malware, but then you're going to send messages after that. And so we would like to have security guarantees in this context too. And these are post-compromise security guarantees. Now you can't have the same level of security as you do for forward secrecy, because the adversary might be able to impersonate you if they know everything you know. But you can have nearly as good, right? And it turns out, and this is what Signal achieves with its ratcheting, it turns out that you can make an adversary who knows your keys, you can force them to be active. And that means if they learn your keys, they have to actively intercept every message that you send, or the moment you get one message exchange through, derive one new key, you'll mix that fresh secret into your session state, and the resulting keys will be secret again. 
So this is sometimes called future secrecy or backward secrecy, but the arrow directions really confused me. So that's why we call it post-compromise security. All right, and how do you achieve this? Well, as I said, so Signal does this with a sort of pairwise ratcheting thing, and these, uh, these gifts are stolen from Luke Garrett. And so in Signal, parties take turns to generate new Diffie-Hellman keys and send them to each other in a ping-pong manner. So one of the challenges here, and I'll talk about that in a bit, is that, well, we have these large groups of people, and you might have multiple devices, and we would like our ratcheting to work in this scenario too. Okay, enough talking. So let me introduce Art. So we have a new protocol that we designed here. Uh, we called it Art for asynchronous ratcheting trees. And it's an asynchronous uh, group key exchange. It works based on these Diffie-Hellman key trees. I actually can't see my slides from here. Uh, well, it allows any group member to update their key. So it allows this sort of signal ratcheting ping pong construction. Uh, and this means we're gonna prove that it has post-compromise security. And because it's based on trees, most of the cooperations scale logarithmically. And this is great, because it means we don't need to pay linear cost, but we can still get updates for post-compromised security. Okay, let me tell you how it works. I need a couple building blocks. So the first building block I'm gonna need are pre-keys. Pre-keys are something Signal introduced to do asynchronous Diffie-Hellman. And you can think of them as just doing a Diffie-Hellman key exchange, but the first round you did earlier in advance and you put it on a server somewhere. So I generate a public key, I'll put it on a server somewhere, and anyone who wants to send a message to me goes to that server, gets the public key, does a key exchange, I'm not online for this process, and sends me a message. So that's a pre-key. You can think of it as it lets you get rid of one round of interaction from one Diffie-Hellman exchange. And the other thing I need is trees for AKA. So let me tell you about trees. So this is a fairly old idea from the literature. Symmetric key trees go back to the 80s, I think. Public key trees go a little bit later. And there are dozens of protocols that use this. I'm going to use this A and B notation, where DHAB is the Diffie-Hellman shared secret between A and B. But you can think of this as just having a secret key X, a secret key Y, and we're going to write a node above those two nodes, and the secret key at that node is going to be the Diffie-Hellman shared secret between them. Why is it good to write it in this tree format? Well, if we have another two people, C and D, we can draw another node above the parents, so the grandparents of each person, uh, and that shared secret key has a sort of four-way Diffie-Hellman property. So it works that anybody who knows any one of the four secret leaf keys can construct the root, but anyone who doesn't know any of those, even if they know all public keys in the tree, the resulting key at the root will be secret. So in art, we're going to use the key at the top of the tree to be the shared group key with a bunch of key derivations mixed in. Okay, so at this stage, you might be thinking, well, we're done, right? I told you we want to do messaging. I told you we can use pre-keys to make things asynchronous, and I told you we can use trees to derive group keys. So we're going to take a tree, we're going to stick pre-keys in it, and we'll do messaging, and we'll be done. This did not work. I'll tell you why. So there's a couple problems. So problem number one is that you need it to be asynchronous. So let me walk you through sending a message. We're going to have A send a message to B, C, and D. B, C, and D are going to be offline. All right, how do you send a message? Well, you need to encrypt that message with a key because it's end-to-end -end encrypted. How do you get that key? That key, it's going to be at the root of a tree. How do you get a tree? We need to build the tree. All right, let's build a tree. So the first thing we need to do is fill in the node above A. A is the group creator. And this we can do because we have pre-keys. So A is going to fetch a pre-key for B. That's a Diffie-Hellman public key. Now A knows B's public key. A knows their own secret key. And so I can put them together and assign the resulting secret to the node above A and B. Great, that's step one. We need to fill in the rest of the tree. So we need to get the public key at the next level up. We know the secret key at this level. And so we can compute the Diffie-Hellman shared secret for the root. And this is where we jam up. Right, you might see the problem now. And the problem is that... This DHCD public key, we can't, A cannot fetch that public key from anywhere. <coughs> right, that public key can only be computed by knowing the secret key, and the secret key is the Diffie-Hellman share between C and D. You might maybe wonder how any tree-based key exchange protocol ever worked. And the answer is, if C were online at this stage, it would be fine. C could come online, realize that they're in a group, produce this public key, send it to A, a could then use it, complete the group, and you'd be done. And so this is how all the tree key exchange protocols work. They have complicated ways to elect people to broadcast the right public keys. But it doesn't work for us because we can't assume they're online. All right, so what do you do? Well, let me paint a picture of a hypothetical magic world. 
In this hypothetical magic world, A somehow knew a shared secret authentic key for every other leaf of the tree. Okay, so A knows a key that's shared only between the creator and B, another one creator and C, another one creator and D. In this magic world, we would now be okay. Right? A could now construct a group because it knows the two secret keys on the right. It could construct the secret key at that node. So it could construct the public key at that node. So it could construct the public key at the root. Okay, so if we could do this, we'd be done. But we can do this, and the reason is that each of these two keys, these are two-party offline key exchange keys. And we know how to build these. Signal already solves this problem. Right? We can fetch a pre-key for each person. We can do a key exchange of our choice that's as authenticated and whiz-bang and fancy as we like, derive a shared secret key, and use that secret key as the leaf for each node in turn. And then we delete the key. So the creator, you can think of this a little bit like a zero RTT mode. The creator has initial trust in that it knows every key. Later, there'll be updates. These remove the trust in the, key, in the creator. But we talk about this in the paper. OK, so now we're done, right? Well, as expected, not quite. And the other thing I need to tell you about is the whole reason we did all this, the whole reason we built trees and we wanted to design a new protocol is we wanted to do ratcheting, right? We wanted to find a way to mix in new Diffie-Hellman values continuously to your messaging key. And so I need to tell you, if you have a tree, how do you do ratcheting? How do you mix in a new Diffie-Hellman value? And then once we have ratcheting, we'll hash chain the results the results, the group secrets at the root together, and this is where you're going to get post-compromised security from. Okay, so think for a minute about if you have one of these trees, what would change if A wanted to change their key to some new value? Okay, so this is the tree you had, and A wants to decide they have a new Diffie-Hellman public key, and they want everybody else now to use this one, not their old one. All right? what changes between these two trees? Well, one thing that changes is the parent of A because that's now based on a new value. Another thing that changes is the root of the tree. You'd really hope that the new key at the root of the tree would change. But crucially, nothing else in the tree changes. And that's the important observation. That's why we can do ratcheting fast. Because this, the tree is a binary tree, so it's of logarithmic depth. And that means the size of the change, if one person changes their key, is only logarithmic. Okay? So if you want to update your key, your A, you want to hit the ping pong ball, update, uh, generate a new fresh value. Uh, you just do it. You know enough values in the tree to derive the new secret keys from you up to the root. From them, you derive the new public keys. And then you broadcast those new public keys to everybody else. Everybody else, when they get them, can fish out the ones that affect their path to the root of the tree, put them into their copy of the tree, and rederive the new group shared secret. All right. And this works asynchronously. A can perform the entire update themselves, compute all the public keys and send them off. A is offline. B then comes online, fetches the new update, applies it, and can immediately decrypt messages. So this is asynchronous ratcheting with all the whiz-bang flash that you would expect. And it works for any member in the tree. OK. So I told you how it works. So in the remaining five minutes, <laughs> let me tell you about all the other stuff you have to do if you're designing a new protocol. Uh, so one thing you should do is you should implement it. Right? You should make sure, this is for a couple of reasons. One reason is to make sure that the pseudocode you wrote actually corresponds to a protocol that works. So that when you say A derives a key, when you run that code, that key is actually derived by A and it's the same key that's derived by B. This is not as trivial as you might think. Uh, but fortunately, we got it right. Uh, John implemented the code. Uh, it's up on GitHub now. Uh, and you can run it yourself and check that. This is not a complicated, optimized imp implementation. But you can check that it works and that it derives keys the way it should. The other reason we want to do this is, of course, to benchmark. Right? We want to check that we think this should be logarithmic speed. It, are the updates really logarithmic cost? Is it feasible to run a group of, let's say, 1,000 members? And so we did that too. There were some graphs in the paper. Um, but you can very clearly see that when you run pairwise ratcheting, which is what we benchmarked against, uh, when you run pairwise ratcheting, the cost goes up linearly as you'd expect. If you have 1,000 people, you have to do 1,000 exponentiations and encrypt a message 1,000 times. If you do art, you only have to do it log 1,000 times. And so you have these nice pair of graphs where one, we are much faster than the benchmark. 
So this is good. Uh, the other thing that maybe is more interesting to people in this room is that, of course, we have to prove that this is secure. Uh, this is also not trivial. This one you probably expected. Uh, there's a lot of things to talk, out, talk about, and I would love to talk about them afterwards, but I'm not going to go into the detail of the proofs here because they get very complicated. But a couple of things to remark upon. So we have a Bellari rog array model, so there's a game-based computational model for what we think is the core of the ratcheting design. So this is of the trees of uh, setting up a group, updating your key, and deriving a session key. And that session key, we prove standard key exchange properties, which maybe I would like to claim now should include post-compromise security. But we prove post-compromise security of this key. What we don't prove in this pen and paper world is authentication. And so you remember earlier, we had these magic keys, leaf keys, that are authenticated keys. And so we also need to show that if the keys at the leaf are authenticated, then the resulting group key is authenticated as well. And we actually thought this would be trivial, but you can't claim trivial in a paper, so we verified it in Tamarin. Uh, Tamarin is a symbolic protocol verification tool. You've seen some talks about it already, maybe. Um, and so we encoded the tree as a black box, and using a black box view of the of art of the tree construction we verified authentication properties and in fact in an earlier version of art all we did was authenticate the leaves and that's actually not enough and tamarin found this attack the reason it's not enough is that you also need to authenticate the public keys that you send to everybody else right when you send an update that update also needs to be authenticated which in hindsight is obvious but this is why we do formal analysis and so Tamarin found this attack and we fixed it. You now you authenticate the updates and Tamarin verified the fix. So this is pretty cool. Uh, Kevin read a lot of the Tamarin models. Kevin is also sitting here. OK, so let me wrap up. I'm going to wrap up with a summary and then two pitches. Uh, so the summary is we have a new protocol called ART. Uh, ART lets you build uh, secure group messaging in a whiz-bang, flashy, ratcheting way, the way we already have for two-party messaging with Signal. So it's scalable, it scales logarithmically, it has post-compromised security, it lets you do end-to-end -end encryption, and it supports groups the same way it supports pairwise. So this is pretty cool, we think. So my pitch at the end of this is, if you also think this is cool, we're still working on this. Uh, there's now an ITF working group, Messaging Layer Security, uh, which was, of course, not named in relation to transport layer security at all. Uh, there's a website, there's a mailing list, ITF meets three times a year, there are some interim meetings, and we're working on solving a lot of the problems that you don't have to solve in an academic paper. Like, among other things, uh, how do you do dynamic groups here? How do you add and remove people? How do, what packet header encoding should you have? How do you know when you receive bits what packet you're getting? How do you support out-of-order messages? Things like that. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting problems there, but in particular for everyone in this room, uh, at some point, large, complicated protocol objects are going to come out of this group. And we as a community should prove things about these protocol objects. And this is really hard. These are big and complicated. They have these unbounded side trees in, which is a challenge for many tools. And we're kind of lacking many methodologies, both Tamarin style and pen and paper, that can really handle this sort of complexity which also means there's lots of interesting research questions. Uh, so please come talk to me or John or Cass or any of us if you're interested in this. Uh, the second pitch I have is that Cass would like me to tell you that he is hiring. Uh, Cass is sitting at the back. Uh, and if you want a job with Cass, he's pretty great to work with, I can confirm. Uh, so talk to him. Uh, finally, uh, co-authors, uh, you can see the five of us here. Nearly all of us have made it. We're now scattered across the globe. Cass is in Germany, Kevin's in Canada, John and I are in London. Nearly all of us have made it to art, to, to CCS, to come and talk to you about art. So please come and talk to us and email Luke. Thank you. <laughs>